Hey there, interwebs, and welcome to a special Halloween episode of How Fascinating. What makes it so special, you may ask? This is going to be the first episode with a live portion, but before I can get to that, I have to give you some background first. Once upon a time, there was a Transylvanian mystic who played the pipe organ and dabbled in the occult, emigrated across the Atlantic, lived in a cave in the woods, and established America's first ever doomsday cult. And I swear all of that is true. His name was Johann Kelp, but he Latinized it to Kelpius while attending the University of Altdorf near Nuremberg. This was the style among scholars at the time, which, by the way, was the 1680s. While earning his degree in theology, he became drawn to pietism, which began as a pushback against the formalization of orthodox Lutheranism, but I'm sure you want me to get to that part about the doomsday cult. Fine. Kelpius became a follower of the mathematician, astronomer, and cleric Johann Jakob Zimmermann, and took on the role of magister of Zimmermann's denomination known as the Chapter of Perfection following the man's death. Shortly thereafter, Kelpius and his new followers left Europe for the New World, arriving in Maryland, but eventually settling in Pennsylvania's Wissahickon Valley near the 40th parallel, where they founded the Society of the Woman in the Wilderness in 1694. That name for this all-male commune came from a passage at the start of the Book of Revelation, chapter 12, wherein a woman takes refuge in the forest from the end of the world. Based on an elaborate interpretation of this passage, the society believed that the second coming of Christ and the end of the world would occur that year. The province of Pennsylvania was selected by Kelpius as the ideal site for the arrival of a heavenly kingdom, given its reputation for religious tolerance and location at the edge of a vast, barely settled wilderness, which made it semi-literally the physical end of the world as they knew it. This is where Kelpius and his society got their other names of the hermits or mystics of the Wissahickon. A group of avid astronomers and occultists, these forty hermits spent that year meditating in celibacy and isolation along the banks of the Wissahickon Creek, searching the stars and waiting for the end. Spoiler alert, the world didn't end in the late 17th century, which you might imagine came as quite a blow to the hermits. You might imagine that, but you'd be wrong. According to some sources, they simply revised their initial estimate to the turn of the century, and the group continued to live in much the same manner as they had for more than a decade after the continuation of days, during which time they operated a school for local children, conducted public worship services, and shared their medical knowledge with other settlers. They even constructed a 40 by 40 foot square tabernacle, 40 being a number with special importance to the mystics, and directed a rudimentary observatory atop it, which is claimed by some to be the first of its kind in the New World. In addition to being a theologian, occultist, and astronomer, Kelpius was also a musician, and he used his time to write a 70-page hymn book, earning him the title of the first Pennsylvanian composer. Its harmonies show considerable musical talent, and it is believed to be the first musical manuscript compiled in the 13 British colonies. He originally wrote it in his native German, but English translations are attributed to his disciple Christopher Witt. Witt is also believed to have built the society a pipe organ, the first to be privately owned in North America, and painted this portrait of Kelpius, which is also one of the first oil portraits created in the 13 colonies. The hermits can claim many of America's firsts, but that's pretty easy to do when you show up in the 1690s. The Society of the Woman in the Wilderness eventually disbanded following Kelpius's death in 1708, and although some members such as Johann Zelig and Konrad Matahai continued to live as woodland hermits into the 1740s, many of them simply returned to normal lives in society, likely giving up on celibacy to marry and have children. Ah, uh, if only more doomsday cults could be so reasonable. Actually, describing them as doomsday cultists is perhaps a bit unfair. Yes, they were a small religious sect anticipating the end of the world, but they were still learned men and well-educated by the standards of their time. Working together, the hermits practiced not only mysticism, but also medicine, botany, alchemy, astronomy, astrology, theology, occultism, and even straight-up magic. Those last couple of subjects lead me to the section of this story which I'm going to charitably describe as less credible. Allegedly, according to one account published some twenty years after his death, Kelpius possessed the Philosopher's Stone a magical artifact which could transmute base metals into gold, grant its wield to eternal life, and presumably also whiten your teeth and locate every sock you've ever lost to the laundry gnomes. Already I can see a plot hole in this story, because that part about eternal life clearly didn't apply to Kelpius. Because there was nobody whom he felt he could trust with an object of such phenomenal power, Kelpius on his deathbed gave the stone concealed within a box to a follower, along with the instructions to yeet that john straight into the Wissahickon Creek so it would wash out to the Schuylkill River and be lost forever. As the box sank into the deep water, there was an explosion with flashes of lightning and peals like unto thunder, or so the story goes. My implausible but not impossible theory is that the mad alchemist somehow got his hands on a big-ass chunk of cesium or other alkali metal and didn't understand what it was. The same account also tells us that Kelpius did not believe he would die, and that he'd merely translate into another state of existence, a bit like lead transmuting to gold, I suppose. 
Admittedly, we have no idea where Kelpius's physical remains actually are, but then again, there are lots of dead people whose final resting place remains unknown. Still, tis the season for ghost stories, so now I'll kick it over to myself at the possible location of Kelpius's spirit. Take it away, me. Hey there, interwebs. I'm currently standing next to the Rosicrucian marker outside the Cave of Kelpius, and already there are several things wrong with that. For starters, this marker claims that he was born in 1673, but all the evidence which I've found indicates that he was actually born six years prior in 1667. Next, this isn't actually a cave. It's clearly a man-made structure, although it's possible it was a pre-existing cave which was later expanded upon. Perhaps most damningly, there's no evidence Kelpius actually lived here. We do know, however, that he lived in this area, and so for the sake of convenience, people have just sort of decided to accept this as the cave of Kelpius, even if this exact spot wasn't actually his. Some people argue that nobody ever actually lived here, and that it was merely a spring house, a sort of pre-electricity refrigerator. That theory, however, is contradicted by the fact that it used to have a chimney and fireplace. I say used to, because sometime after 1940 they had to be removed due to vandalism. Unfortunately, I'm unable to find any evidence of their existence today. If this is where Calpheus lived, then it's also what might have killed him. Records are frustratingly scant, but it seems that he died of tuberculosis, and if that was the case, then living in damp conditions such as these would not have helped his health. Amusingly, what you're watching right now isn't the only video on YouTube about this place, and more than one describe it as cold, creepy, or claustrophobic, to which I reply, no shit. It's absolutely tiny and has no provision for natural light to enter, except via the door. Some people even believe it to be haunted and report feeling a chill come over them as they enter. The rational portion of my viewers have probably already figured out why. It's dark, damp, and made of stone, so the whole place acts like one big heatsink, drawing the warmth out of whatever is contained inside. Even if the specific building wasn't a spring house, they were constructed much like this, and with good reason. They were designed to keep things cold and preserve them. Is it preserving the ghost of Kelpius, though? I very much doubt that, but let's ask my wonderful witch of a girlfriend and paranormal correspondent. What do you think, dear? Does it feel haunted to you? No. Well, there you have it, folks. The Cave of Kelpius and the story of America's first doomsday cult. Thanks for watching, and have a fascinating day.